Um, a number of guests to join Andrew at this stage. Vittorio, please come and join us uh, once again. Vittorio, of course, is the CEO of Vodafone Group PLC. Andrew is with me on the stage. It's the right honourable Justin, uh, Justin Greening here, MP, Secretary of State for International Aid. I think she may be joining us a little bit later, so Justin will uh, join us on the stage when, when she gets here. Professor Jeffrey Sachs, you will all know well, uh, Director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. And Dame Helen Alexander with us at this stage in the proceedings. There must be a lady on the stage alongside me. Yes, there is, thank you very much indeed. Dame Helen Alexander is, amongst other things, chair of UBM uh, PLC, but I know you'll uh, know that she wears uh, various hats aside from that one. Uh, guys, we've heard about how mobile technology benefits recipients and governments, especially in developing markets. I really want to get a sense from all of you individually what mobile technolo technology means to you, what it, why it matters to you, uh, and what your motivation in being here today is. Justin, we, uh, sorry, Dame Helen Alexander, we haven't heard from you yet, so, so let's start <laughs> with you. Yeah. Well, um, there are a couple of areas that I think it's particularly important for me and one of the reasons I'm here. One is around the media business and the whole um, version of how media actually plays its part uh, in a developing economy and how it moves forward, and that's a lot to do with mobile these days. And the other is in terms of the interface between businesses and uh, charities and how they are able to learn from each other in mobile. So it's those two sides, I would say. Thank you. Um, Jeffrey, um, I know that... Uh You've said in the past, a cell phone is the single most transformative technology for development. Has it, to your mind, lived up to its promise? Absolutely, and I think there's a huge amount to come. Uh, I've been uh, in, in this uh, development uh, sphere for 30 years, and I've never seen anything like uh, what mobile has done. One thing that's completely amazing about mobile is that it has done it without foreign assistance. Uh, so it has been a unique combination of fantastic technology and a business model that goes right to uh, the, the poor as well as the well-to-do. Everybody loves their mobile uh, and everybody uses it and everybody has multiple applications for it. It doesn't mean that we can do without uh, many other kinds of uh, development approaches, but the transformative power of this is phenomenal. Health, education, business, uh, information, family staying together, safety, uh, emergency response, uh, banking, payments, transfers, the works. And I think we're going to see another revolution when machines are talking to machines a lot more. That's uh, uh, the next great step of, of, of this revolution uh, that I think is going to uh, have a phenomenal effect. So uh, everything that I've seen uh, makes me even more uh, partial to this as, as a great breakthrough. You're already sold on mobile, of course, Vittorio. <laughs> <laughs> we hope so. What would your key <laughs> message uh, be? Uh, from today's discussions? You know, I was thinking when you asked before, the panel before, you asked where are we zero to 10, and uh, I think you and said two, if I'm, I, I would disagree with that. Mm. I think we are at 0 0.5, <laughs> really. And again, back to, 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 to just your remarks, I think we are just at the beginning. We are just at the beginning. If you ask me uh, my frustration, my frustration is that for years and for years, we have been seeing the opportunity, but it was very difficult to unleash the potential. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you have great companies, pharma companies who start you know, thinking, well, there's something we can do. We have fantastic NGOs who really know the problem because I know what the solution could be, but I don't know the problem. I, d I don't know, I I'm not an expert of whatever, distribution of drugs or uh, education in India or pharma. And then suddenly, you know, in Turkey, uh, we have the farmers club and people start thinking what can do. And governments, very important, governments are becoming more and more aware. Now, 
The interesting thing is, it's governments in emerging markets who are more aware than governments mm -hmm. in uh, mature markets. And this is great, because we're going to learn something from them. Just but to me, we are at 0 0.5 on a scale to 10 of what can be achieved. Justin, I see you are nodding there. Yes, absolutely. I think, um, I think we are at the beginning of what can be a transformative journey. I think we all know how much our own mobiles uh, mean to us and what a hassle it is if you leave them at home. Uh, it feels like a bit of a, a disaster day without your, your contact. Um, I think what's really interesting about how mobile technology can work in development, though, is it's not just about uh, how we can deliver development better. It's opening up new channels of what we can deliver and how we can target it, perhaps, at people in rural communities, for example, in a way that we never would have been able to um, before. I think the other thing, I, I really agreed with what, exactly what uh, Geoffrey was saying. I think the other thing is this ability to pull in the private sector into the development agenda in a way that I think just hasn't been possible before. Um, a really natural fit between what the private sector is doing in terms of innovation and technology and what will work in the developing world too. Um, and then the final point that, that Victoria just made, I think, is, is really interesting, which is this, this sense that the developing world and, and some of those, those emerging markets are going to jump over our own. And I'm sure you, you've been hearing uh, earlier today about some of the banking um, innovations millions of Kenyans without a bank account, but doing mobile banking in a way that most Britons aren't right now. So I think a really interesting dynamic of not just uh, improvement in development delivery and what we can do, but actually us learning from some of those emerging markets in terms of what consumers want in ways that might be applicable back to us. At GSK, um, Andrew, what will incentivize your businesses to invest and take to scale mobile solutions um, that have a social impact. You touched on this in the session beforehand, but is there a clear commercial incentive for you or, or is it a corporate social responsibility? Uh, it's neither really. Um, because, because I think when you talk about it's a corporate social responsibility, mm. immediately people interpret that to be, well, that's the add-on program to everything else mm. you do. Uh, for us, it's absolutely a pivotal part of the value structure of the company. So, so the way I think the people who work at GSK believe and operate is that we take a view that we have, for a time period, custodianship of a series of technologies, ideas, intellectual property, you name it. And the question is, what are you going to do with that? So there's 104,000 people who work for GSK who don't wake up every morning thinking, how can we protect all this knowledge and only make money in the West? They actually look at it and say, how can we leverage this technology to improve health status across the world? That's really what drives them. That's very different to CSR in the traditional mm -hmm. sense. And so if you then step back, and, you, and, and actually just to test that, because people might say, well, yeah, really? Actually, just test that for a second. Why else would a team of scientists spend over 30 years working on the same project for which there is no commercial gain? Why is it that 700 million of the 1 billion doses of vaccine we manufacture every year essentially go to Africa at virtually no profit? That is real proof within the core content of the company of what I've just said to you. So I think from an absolute fundamental perspective, what really drives the people at GSK is how do we give the maximum benefit worldwide? Now, we know we, know we have to make better returns in the West to allow our shareholders to allow us to do what I've just described. Mm. But within the core of the company, that's really the sentiment. Now, then the mobile health piece is simply, and it's simply, you know, but very complicated, it's simply a, an element of how to yeah. leverage that's all of that. And, and for me, in the years I lived in Africa, you know, what was so striking and is so frustrating about Africa is you have this enormous challenge, but there's no, what makes it so difficult to make change on, in the way that people in the West want to see it. There's no formality, there's no system. The whole thing is beautifully informal. And actually, for 50 years, the West has tried to deploy help using a Western mindset. And guess what? Those railway lines weren't there. The formal structures weren't there. The attitudes weren't in there in the same way as the West, probably for, a, for good. Mm. 
Suddenly, mobile brings an ability to bring hundreds of millions of individuals into a similar framework. And it allows you to communicate to individuals at a population scale, which people have been trying to find a solution for for 50 years, just can't do it. Mm. And I think for the first time, you've got a non-confrontational mechanism which allows Africa's amazing, different, informal way of societal working, which is brilliant, to somehow gel with what the rest of the world has been looking for, which is a receptor, a mechanism to try and make change. And I think, I think mobile technology is that receptor, and I think we've been looking for it for a long time. I think it's there now. It allows you to speak to individuals. It allows you to communicate with them as individuals, but at a population scale, and that's how you can move health capacity forward. And then it's all about finding points of leverage, and that's what we do. So for us, it's looking for the, like Mozambique, Let's find a win-win point of leverage where our technology nestles with Vittorio's technology. Let's see whether or not the local community want it. And if they want it, we'll do it. But if those conditions aren't met, we're not going to do it. Can you better collaborate then, Vittorio, amongst all the stakeholders? How do we better collaborate? I think um, now we are seeing, but when I say now, I mean in the last uh, probably couple of years, we are seeing a much better way of uh, working together. A as I was saying in my early remarks, uh, we have got for years a, a debate between people. I mean, I'm thinking about what Michael Joseph said before. Mm -hmm. I mean, the power of, for example, financial services in, uh, and money transfer and microinsurance and the nice things that uh, Michael was describing before has been evident for years. But in many places, the debate between us and the financial sector, just to leave for a second mobile health out, was basically impossible because uh, th there was kind of a corporate to corporate type of debate. Uh, and a little bit also the debate with uh, uh, governments and uh, public institutions. It was a little bit, why do you guys want to get here? We are the regulators, we decide how things work. Now, a little bit as a function of the challenges that the world is facing, a little bit I think, because we are all more mature now. Now, the, I, I really see the, the, the kind of the, the, the four corners of this, uh, uh, of this partnership starting to have a, a positive debate, which is, you know, businesses, each of us thinking about our own part of the puzzle, but not trying to over-dominate, you know, the design of a system, accepting that there is more fluidity, uh, governments accepting that they have to probably not think, you know, in rigid, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, divided silos on how a certain sector should be organized. The aid uh, and the uh, international organizations being, again, more flexible in thing how they can fund and they can uh, uh, make things uh, actually kick off. And the NGOs uh, finally, if I may, getting the concept that if there is no scale, an idea could be beautiful, but honestly, it's going to be just one of thousands of ideas. So these four uh, components of the debate have become now much more cohesive, much more uh, fluid, and, and now that is what we should keep in mind. Keep this kind of fluidity as, uh, as uh, the most important thing. And then the other side is the scalability that we have touched throughout sure. the whole day, because otherwise, you know, you just uh, you know, spread money too thinly. Justin, we, we, we talked earlier on today, and I know that you've only just joined us, but we, we, we were talking earlier on today about joined up thinking, about all stakeholders having a, a sense of longevity because these things take time. You are well aware that in government, that you are in government for a period of time, and you want to see, you want to see success which can be attributed to you. You want some ownership of uh, projects that you've been involved in. How, how do we um, work towards a sort of scalability and sustainability with governments involved who won't necessarily see themselves as uh, having a future you know, four, five, six years down the road? Well, of course, um, I'm sure this one will. <laughs> but um, I, to be honest, I think that's, I'm going to say, I think that's a really uh, overly cynical way, actually, of looking at what generally uh, we're trying to achieve in this area. I think we've got some political consensus in the UK about why this agenda matters. And I think that it's more a question of how much progress we can all make until we pass the baton on. Um, and actually, I think what's interesting is 
When you get an area of development, for example, this, this gradual infusion of technology into development and it works, what we're starting to see, you just asked about collaboration, what we're actually starting to see is competition. Because actually the opportunity to create value, I think, for companies is there. And particularly in uh, places like Africa where you see growth rates that at the moment far outstrip those um, in other parts of the world, actually there's an, there is an emerging market. And I think a lot of companies increasingly realize that if they can get a bit of that market, then they are probably well placed to have a better understanding of the consumer and then to, to perform better as those markets grow. I think what's great is that there is an added bonus here for seeing local economic growth in those markets, but also far better delivery of services. And we, we talked about some of the healthcare delivery. And I, I think some of those ways in which we can see the value chain, for example, in healthcare really improve where you can have te mobile technology flagging up low stocks, which means some of the problems you have over refrigeration and all of those delivery mechanisms in more remote rural areas can be more, more, more streamlined in terms of how they're tackled. I think you really start to get um, a hand-in-hand -hand, uh, public and private sector approach to development that, to my mind, um, is not only more efficient because we get to tap into innovation, but also is ultimately far more sustainable as well. Um, and to go back to your, your kind of original question, I think all governments just want to really get on with this agenda as much as we can. We, we certainly know here in the UK that, that what the public wants to see is us get the maximum out of every single pound of their taxpayer money that we put into development. And I think that's the biggest spur for me in terms of, of getting results on the ground as well. I think that's an optimistic way of looking at it, but I do buy what you say. Uh, Jeffrey. I, I was going to make a slightly different <coughs> point, but I think we're going to find unusually in this sector that a lot of the innovations are going to come from the poor countries back to mm. our country. <coughs> this is a case probably that in many areas it won't be the usual model of innovate in the rich countries, gradually diffuse to the poor countries, but rather the leapfrogging idea like m mm -hmm. uh, which is definitely not an idea that is mainstream in uh, New York City, for example. Uh, you can do more in Western Kenya than you can in New York on uh, mobile-based payments by quite a long distance. Mm -hmm. The reason uh, is that uh, there are pretty elaborate regulatory systems in our countries that stop a lot of innovation right now because there are incumbents there are ways of doing things, whereas this is a disruptive technology. Mm. This is a technology that dramatically lowers costs on many fronts. And in the African context, for example, uh, it's possible to move in in areas uh, where you're seeking low-cost solutions rather desperately, and those will come back, I think, uh, to uh, penetrate uh, the, the high-income country uh, environment. We're seeing uh, in our work in the community health workers, for example, in area after area we say, that would be great for Manhattan. Uh, if we had this kind of outreach from this hospital to this poor community, this is exactly what's needed. And the model is actually coming from the very low income setting. We have a healthcare system that's $8,000 per person per year. We're trying to find solutions in Africa at $50 per person per year. We're finding solutions because of this technology. And then you say, well, there's a lot of arbitrage possible to lower the costs again in our own economy. We're going to see this in education as well. There will be tremendous, tremendous breakthroughs in online education that will change the whole structure of education delivery in the more expensive high-income countries as well. So I think this is not corporate social responsibility. This is investing in a new generation of approaches, of delivery, of how things are going to be done. Because this technology, it's not only the M, the mobile part, it's basically the very deep infusion of data and information in systems management. That's a pervasive, very deep phenomenon. 
which every economy needs uh, to, to get, and we're going to get it in some poor country settings a lot faster. I don't know when the U.S. will ever have electronic medical records that actually connect with each other, but that may be decades away because we have this wholly built system where some poor country is going to say, we're just doing top-down uh, integrated electronic medical records because we have no records right now to speak of and this is going to be a model that will then come back eventually to the United States. Mm -hmm. Managing the downside of connectivity as well as the upside of connectivity I think is also a very important point. Where do you see the opportunities and the priorities, Dame Helen? Well, I agree clearly with the almost everything that's been said, but I think that's all, of, I mean, we're talking there all about the solutions and the applications. Mm. And before that, we've got to get down to something that's basically more affordable because we've heard competition, we've heard innovation, um, and I think those are the things that we start to get when we get something that isn't 50% of disposable income. Mm. It's, you know, the UN target of 5% of disposable income for an affordable internet. And we're using the sort of mobile and internet as a slightly interchangeable definition here. When you've got the internet and the web working, and that's both for broadband generally and for mobile, those are the times that we really have to, those are the targets we really have to work for to get the regulatory environment right, the tax environment right, right. Um, the cost right. And those are the things that are, I think, the, the, the prior challenges before we get to mm. some wonderful solutions. Mm. Do we need an MDG for connectivity, by the way? Is that something we missed out on, Jeffrey, do you think? We have it. Uh, we have in MDG 8 a commitment to bring information technologies to the world. And so it's already part of the Millennium Development Goals. And we need, uh, actually, to keep this vision. Uh, and I think the point you make is a, is a great one. There's a big difference between uh, a mobile phone and broadband. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we need is broadband and very uh, thick uh, data. And uh, that's where some of the wonders are going to come from, uh, from uh, a, uh, the, the pipe that is uh, big enough to be able to accommodate a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of data. That hasn't happened yet adequately. Um, there are estimates that by 2017 or 2018, 3G will cover 80 or 85 percent of the population is one uh, common uh, measure that's seen. But we're going to need a lot of fiber. We're going to need a lot of building out that infrastructure. I hope the industry is going to do it because uh, I think there will be huge value. And you can't justify it on the basis of current traffic, but it is going to leverage the economy enough to pay for itself, in my opinion, many times over. Is, is the industry ready? Is it getting on with it, Victoria? I think the industry is ready. I, I, um, it's interesting what uh, Jeff, Jeffrey just said, the kind of investments in front of us. And I'd like to go back to the question that was raised by the professor from London Business School back there. I don't know if she's still in the room or not. When she said that the students are saying, mm. you know, one million, two million, three million is nothing compared to the profits of these companies. Why don't they do more? To me, the, the point is exactly a little bit what uh, Andrew said. Saying that we need to have a corporate social responsibility program to me is a bit of a nonsense. I always found that the corporate social responsibility programs were like saying to an individual, you should have an honesty program. I mean, either I'm honest or I'm not. I don't need an honesty program. The, the reality is that we are, as you correctly said, basically deploying our own technology and making it available to everybody else profit, non-profit, pharma, banks, uh, whatever, to improve, on one hand, the individual's living conditions, and on the other hand, the company's productivity. And the joint interaction of these two things actually delivers social progress. And I believe that our industry is doing it. Of course, we have to do it at the pace, which is consistent with uh, the fact that the shareholders who give us the money need to get some returns. But if I were the, the, the professor of LBS, I would say, you know what? It's not about the one, two, three, five, ten million that we give, which, by the way, we also give, but that's more part of the foundation activity, which is a, kind of a separate thing. It's really about the big long-term impact that these infrastructures will have on individuals and businesses. And I'm convinced that my industry is doing its own part. But as I said in my earlier remarks, we are an enabler. Mm. Then we need to work together with everybody else. Mm. I just 
refer back to, to a point that uh, was made just uh, moments ago about, whereas in the past we had an information-rich, information-poor society and we knew that there was a huge divide. How close are we to a data-rich, i.e. broadband-rich, broadband-poor environment? I've, I've, I've asked you, you know, how close we are so far as the industry is concerned. And I, and I put this question out because, Andrew, I want you to give us a sense of how, if you're not enabled by the Vodafones of this world, how that might hold you up in providing better services going forward in development. I'd make a couple of points, I think. The first, and I'm going to come back to something I alluded to a minute ago. There's a massive mistake we make in places like London to try and insist that culture in Africa should be and is the same as culture in London. Mm. It's not. The way societies live, the way villages are constructed, the way people's value system ev has evolved is completely different. Mm. And, and I think we, we need to be extremely humble around facilitating the development of technologies which suit those cultures mm -hmm. and not try and say what's the gap between what New York and London has achieved mm -hmm. and how quickly can we get villages in Malawi to be like New York and London. Actually, I think it's quite a good chance for people to learn from a lot of mistakes that have been, <laughs> been made in the West. So I, I just think there is a really important element around not just saying what is the gap but actually be much more thoughtful about what really do those populations want to allow them to further facilitate and develop the way they want to develop, mm -hmm. right, as a, as a society. Because I think it's a, there are some fundamental differences in the way societies uh, have, have operated. So, I mean, I, I would make that as the first point. From our specific perspective, mHealth is a very important piece of this. Why? Because it is the way in which we can start to see a true evolution of health worker capacity being built. How? Because it allows health workers to communicate with each other, to start to manage their data flows, to start to manage case loads, patient loads, and all of the rest. And it allows them to operate through what are very logistical challenges and challenging environments. So from our perspective, it's an important key catalyst. It's not the, an it's, it's a catalyst. It's not the answer. The, nobody is going to get better because they've got a cell phone, right? They are going to get better, nor, frankly, whether it's on 3G or 4G, they're going to get better because something happens through that channel which connects them more effectively with somebody, another human probably, who is going to do something to make their outcome better. And so for me, it's a catalyzing effect. Therefore, absence means things will go slower. It means that we'll be more patchy. We will find it more difficult to scale up pilots to industrial scale i.e. touching large parts of the population, and ultimately it will be more frustrating. The quicker the pipes open, the quicker the channels open, the faster all of that will happen, the faster the capacity will come on stream, and the faster we'll see death rates fall in child uh, survival going up and the like. And that, for me, is what this is about. It's a catalyst. It's not the answer, but it's a very broad applied catalyst. As you travel around the world, Justine, what do people ask for most when... Um, we consider mobile and development just out of interest? I think well, the, the, the thing that, setting aside the technology side of things mm. that people want most is a job, to be perfectly honest, mm. which is why economic growth is at the heart of successful uh, development eventually. I think it depends where you go, but broadly people are interested in the use of technology to be heard. So often it's one of the ways in which they can flag up corruption at the local level and do that in a way that's quick but also anonymous. Um, often it is around healthcare delivery in particular. And then the third strand really has been around economy and I think we shouldn't underestimate how uh, this ability to do uh, mobile banking without needing a bank account, how important that's been to facilitate local economic development. And, and then the final thing I would say, which I think is a, an opportunity as well as a threat in a way, is the role of women in all of this. So uh, mobile banking and all of these technology, in the hands, a mobile in the hands of a woman can be incredibly empowering for her and indeed for her child in terms of getting healthcare. But if it's, if it's something that you don't have access to as a technology, then 
it's, it's just as bad in a way. So I think one of the, the good challenges we get from progress in this agenda is making sure that it's one that is something that everybody can have an involvement in. And, it, and just listening to Andrew um, had gave me a flashback to my time at the London Business School when I, we were sat in sort of 1999, 2000, discussing whether the internet would mean that um, you know, a whole range of industries as we knew them would cease to exist. Um, and I think the conclusion on all of that debate is actually, predominantly, the internet did change a huge number of things, but ultimately it was about a channel and a route to market. Um, it was never a silver bullet in, it, in itself, and I think it's a similar discussion in terms of development. Mm. Can I Sorry, go on, there? yes. Because uh, it's absolutely about the content. You don't get those health services, you don't get those kind of innovations unless there's content there. And one of the things that government can do is to open up government data. And that's clearly true in all sorts of countries, that mm. if you have information or whatever you like to call it available and allows people to treat it in the way that they will in culturally different ways and just play with it, you start getting entrepreneurialism, innovation, mm. costs coming down in all sorts of fields, and you're not restricting it to a health or an education. Mm. You're, you're actually opening up something that is completely powerful. Go on, Jeffrey. Yeah, I, I think mm. another thing that is interesting that people want uh, that they didn't have uh, as a result of this is they want electricity uh, mm. in, in their homes. Uh, and uh, there has been an incredible change in the demand for home-based electricity because people have their phones much faster than they have electricity. And they actually don't like going to uh, the guy uh, in the center of the village with the car battery that has uh, a thousand phones uh, or a hundred phones mm -hmm. dangling from the battery. And so what we're seeing is a spread of solar panels. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing uh, a political demand for the grid to be expanded. This is actually phenomenally important mm. and very interesting because it's making for people ex much more concrete than one would have guessed because you would have thought that demand would have been there anyway for a light bulb. Mm. But this is more important than a light bulb because people love their phones. Mm. Uh, it's so versatile for so many things, but now they want them to be charged <laughs> at, the, at the right time. And so I think we should leverage this, actually. It's mm. no, not a joke. It's a, it's a real opportunity to build out a vital, another piece of the infrastructure, mm. which is uh, modern power and especially solar power, which is one thing that Africa has in, uh, in, in the greatest abundance in the world uh, that is uh, going to be pushed by this. Can I open this up to the floor at this stage? You've got about 20 minutes to go. You have uh, a great panel of experts here. Um, We'll, we'll do a bit of crystal ball gazing, perhaps, in the last five or six minutes. But yes, a couple of questions here. Starting off with you, sir, and then down here. Can we get the microphones down here? And we've got one over here and two at the back. Have we got any microphones? Or do you just, at this stage, want to stand up without a microphone? Have you got a loud voice, sir? Good, then. <laughs> Andrew. Well, I think that's part of why we're still 2 out of 10 or 0 0.5 out of 10. I, and I think that there's no question that this has been very much a demand side phenomena so far. I think I'd come back to this notion of how mobile technology, though, can bring a voice to the village or the individual in a way that has not really been possible up until now, uh, in a way in which organizations can react to really sustainably. Um, so I think that's an area for the f very much the envisioning of how we should be ambitious. Uh, I think it raises all sorts of new questions around how, do, how, does, how does the system react? How do governments react to that? I think governments who are trying to you know, manage as best they can extremely difficult finite resources to even get off the dime in terms of healthcare provision, I can imagine being somewhat reticent to open the floodgates on, if you will, uh, please going to have the net this and this and this. But it, for me, that is another chapter of the journey. I personally think we have to, we, I mean the world, not we here, 
we have to earn our credentials on the supply side. Uh, you know, let's be honest, we haven't got it nailed yet. I think there is an enor enormous amount to do to get the basics done. That feels to me like an, a next chapter with its own challenges. Victoria, and then yeah, if I may, I am a little bit more optimistic. <laughs> I, I really believe that, we, as I said, it's, it's maybe not even 0 0.5, but I am convinced that if initiatives like the one that you know, we are having together, or take the fistula initiative that we have in Tanzania now, and assume, as it is the case, that this is really successful and really takes up, this will have an incredible educational or informational effect on these women, specifically, but then imagine the families, imagine the communities. And I am, I am an optimist. I really believe that uh, you know, nobody has the monopoly of good ideas. Many, many, many more good ideas will just spring out of that thing. Then the challenge will be how do we satisfy all these requests? And yes, there could be some, a little bit of pushback from governments who suddenly say, oh my God, now I really have to deliver. Well, but, welcome, but to isn't, the welcome to health Yeah, but isn't, isn't that good? Isn't that good? I mean, this is exactly why all of you gave up some of your time today to be here with us. Then, of course, we will have to sort out the economics and the logistics and this and that. But I am a great believer in do one M-Pesa and then suddenly people will come with another now. Do one fistula and people will come with good ideas. And I do believe that, you know, quite frankly, I'm very grateful to Glaxo because, you know, we, we can just start things and then everything will roll into the remaining 9.5 of the score. No, Justin. I really think that um, there's a huge demand for, for advice and education. Actually, I think one of the first healthcare-focused aspects of this is preventative healthcare. Um, the other sort of opportunity, if there's a threat there, is then literacy, and literally ensuring that if you're texting somebody, they can read what they've just received. And it may be that as we see smartphones develop, we can use images more, and that's less of a barrier. But I think it's preventative healthcare is one of the first earliest places we can make a big difference. I take another question here, please. Um, I'm Diviani, a student at LBS, and I'm very happy to hear from Vittorio and Andrew on the way that you're looking at uh, serving the base. The pyramid is part of the core business. Um, my question is on, um, as we look at moving beyond aid, um, just to simplify what we've been hearing today, it seems like there's um, clear willingness and ability to pay by the base of the pyramid for M-Pesa for financial services, but beyond that, the big opportunity seems to be in mobile technology as an enabler to deliver other services. Um, and so my question then is, as we look at the business, uh, who pays for that connectivity? Is it, um, is it DFID and, and you know, other aid agencies? Is it the government? Is it the consumer? Or is it GSK and Vodafone? Um, who wants to take that? Yes, go on, start. I'll, I'll yep. go. I think, I mean, I think David's role in this is to often help pilot different innovative uh, ways of using mobile technology and also to look at whether we feel there's a scale-up capability in some of these new approaches. I would say, that, again, let's look at how things developed in the, in the UK and across uh, other markets. I think just simply outreach meant that a lot of our internet um, and mobile providers don't actually charge because they have advertising space and I think again it's about collaboration and starting to see that once you've built a network that in itself has some value you just need to find the person who who will have a value for it themselves in possibly their business. Andrew. Yeah I mean I, I, I certainly share that and I think almost the answer to your question is it, you could have asked a different question which is how do you make sure it's going to be sustainable it's going to be sustainable when somebody figures out that they're prepared to chip in to make it work. So in, in the kind of space we're talking about, was an example I think discussed this morning, a project we're running in Nigeria around anti-counterfeiting, where we've got a mechanism where we, we print on the packs a particular code. The, the patient can then essentially communicate directly with an agency to validate whether their pack is really a Glaxo product or is it a counterfeit product. Obviously, there's a cost to that, we benefit because if there's higher confidence in the products and people want to buy a product they trust, we know we're probably going to sell a bit more, so we're going to chip into that. Governments are, it's good for government to have less counterfeiting, so there's something in it for them. And I think you could articulate a similar thing in the Mozambique approach. Obviously, if there is higher 
um, adherence to vaccination schedules, that's likely to be good for us. Actually, it's also extremely good for the people of Mozambique because they are actually going to get the full benefit of what they've already invested in. And so you can see there who are likely to be the people who are going to say, okay, we're all, e we're all going to find a way to chip into this to make it work. And I think where you find, that's, that's for me why you have to take, I know people don't like pilots, but it's why it's worth taking time to think this through right before you leap forward. Because if you can get it right at the beginning, then you can more quickly move to sustainability because you get more partners who are prepared to say there's something in it for me and we'll all share it and then we'll move forward. And I think, we'll, I think we're going to see more and more of that now. I think people are much more real world thinking about this than they were maybe 10 years ago. Jeffrey. I think one of the things that uh, the whole mobile has opened up, of course, are better business models for delivery to poor people. And the prepay model for the cell phone was, of course, the greatest breakthrough that uh, you could buy a small number of units, prepay, save a tremendous amount of transactions costs that never could have been justified for such a low-income consumer. And I think we're going to see literally the same kind of systems on many other service delivery. We're already seeing prepay electricity, for example. So uh, being part of a small solar grid, for example, where you buy electricity by the unit, 100, uh, 100 watt hours or whatever you're buying, and you prepay on your mobile, saves the metering, the maintenance, the uh, overhead, and allows you to service a very low income community by the same model. And so I think we're going to see when you ask the question, who will pay, the technology itself enables new delivery models that really reduce the costs uh, they allow for monitoring, uh, for, uh, for maintenance, for lower transactions that can be very, very powerful. And so M electricity or M other things uh, will be another part of the, um, the whole business rollout of many other sectors. Two questions, one from the chap at the back, keep it short, and then I'll take another one from you, sir, at the back. Um, and we'll try and deal with them both. Gebulch from Accenture Development Partnerships. There's a parallel conference going on on the other side of, of London about nutrition and private sector approaches to nutrition. And I've just been chairing a, a panel there with um, BASF, um, Mars and Rabobank talking about collaboration in the pre-competitive space. And so I have a specific question to bring back about the role of technology in not just allowing us to have enough food to eat, but to drive some of these partnerships in food safety, food quality, and malnutrition. Thank you, sir. And just one from you. Uh, Jeffrey Dennis from Care International. Uh, just a very uh, general question. These kind of partnerships are extremely important to us. We have one with GSK already, for which I'm really grateful. How should we try and develop these partnerships in general terms? Just a few comments from your panel would be great. In order to get corporates, INGOs like Care International and DFID working more closely together. Excellent Thank you. question. Good. Okay. Should, should we do, who wants to deal with which first? We've got nutrition and technology, and we've got the development of partnerships. Helen. I'll, I'll, I'll do partnerships for a bit. Um, <laughs> I think it, it, it's, technology has its part to play, but what immediately springs to my mind, I chair a company called UBM. One of the things we do is our business is organizing events, uh, trade shows, if you like. Our contribution is that we do that in a not-for-profit way for NGOs. So if you like, it's a way of bringing NGOs together. Uh, who they then talk to each other and corporates come in at the same time. So you get whatever mix people want out of that. This originated in Brazil. Uh, it then developed into um, the UK and then America and India. So it didn't start here. It didn't start in the US. It started in Brazil and it's now in a second and third years in some of those places. So those are about face to face. They're not about entirely technology enabled. They're actually bringing people together. And our version of that was we were talking about CSR earlier. We don't do that. We, what we do is we do what we do best, which is 
running these kinds of shows, these, making these opportunities. So I, th I do actually think face-to-face -face has its place. We're talking here about mobile, and um, let's not forget the other forms of communication as well. And I think it's long, hard work, actually. And, you know, if I look at um, something at the World Wide Web Foundation, where we have these partnerships, but it takes a long time, it takes a uh, huge commitment from both sides, and it's about not giving up. You see the other side's point of view, you understand where they're coming from, and you just sheer hard work. No, no magic. <coughs> Anybody else? Developing partnerships, technology, nutrition. Let me give a, <coughs> a plug for uh, global goals as a major part of this. One of the things that is enabling these uh, models to uh, both be developed in the first place and then to spread are the Millennium Development Goals and the idea that we have some targets that we're trying to reach, we have some metrics that we're trying to pursue. And in this area, I think there really is a vital opportunity. I'm going to mention one specific one because of uh, the partners on the panel here and because of uh, what you're doing, uh, and that is a massive scaling up of community health workers. Uh, as uh, something that is absolutely central to achieving the Millennium Development Goals and achieving our health targets generally. Mobile makes that possible. Mobile empowers uh, frontline health workers in a way that uh, is unimaginably more powerful than anything that went before it. We have an opportunity to deploy now the village-based workers all over Africa to really uh, not only we have progress on all of the diseases, but to make a tremendous breakthrough uh, to uh, actually bringing down the morbidity and mortality decisively on diseases like malaria, AIDS, TB, uh, and, and others. So I would hope that you would view that as a scalable proposition uh, and uh, urge the partners to scale. And with that uh, together, I think we're going to build uh, models that are more effective, uh, larger, reaching more communities, uh, and spreading the technology fastest. Thank you. Vittorio? Yeah, I, I want to go back to the partnership thing, and you know, maybe it's worth sharing a little bit of uh, my personal experience here. And it's in another thing which I very strongly believe in, which is uh, education, mobile education, because after, I mean, wh what he does is the most important thing, which is survival. But then the next most important thing that we can bring to these societies is really learning, because through learning, of course, we improve uh, long term. So, so we, we, we started a number of uh, uh, mobile learning or mobile education uh, projects. And my experience there has been that the most important thing for, for having these partnerships really work is a little bit, you know, back to what we said before first. One of the partners, and this is very simple rules, one of the partners must be really, really super competent of the specific territory where you want to do this and to really get the affordability levels. I mean, the affordability point is super important. Mm -hmm. What really a fisherman, a, a person in India, a person in Africa, or in London for that matter, you know, or a kid in a this adventurous community in London really can afford in order to access the benefit is very important. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, if, sometimes I have the feeling that we talk a bit about these things without really knowing them. So that's the first point. The second point is a genuine, genuine respect for each other's company or, you know, institutional objectives, i.e. not giving for granted that, you know, a large company have all the money or a government has all the power to impose things or a whatever um, school or a university has all the science. You know, a genuine understanding of uh, each other's objectives is very important. And then the third thing in my uh, experience is true passion in the people who really, I mean, you were talking about people studying on your molecules or whatever things, true, having people who have a true passion for what you want to do and not being dogmatic in the first idea is the right one. I found that when we have these three ingredients, and I'm thinking of Turkey, I'm thinking the farmer's project, or the e-learning in, or mobile learning in India, or whatever, the distribution of antiretroviral viral in uh, South Africa, when you have those three things, uh, the partnership works. And, and it's very important that you preserve all the way through the 
pilot or the initial phases, these true three things. Then the partnership, you know, goes on I into normal life, into steady state, and it becomes an operating activity. But these are the three most important things. Does that make sense, Andrew? Yeah, no, I think it does. I, I want to add something to it, though, because I, I think slightly embedded behind the question was, was not just how do you make a specific partnership work, but how do we get a lot more partnerships operating and how do you get more companies and, and others involved in this. And I think you need to talk to shareholders. So I'm amazed how often people say to me, how on earth does your shareholder base allow you to do what you do on this agenda? I have never been asked once by a single shareholder why we do what we do on this in a negative sense. There is a massive assumption that the shareholders must somehow have a problem with this. It couldn't be further from the truth. And this is a company who spent $500 million so far on, on the malaria vaccine project. So I'm not talking a million bucks here and there. It's a big deal for GSK. And uh, no shareholder has ever come to us and criticized. I think there's a real, op there's a, something to be said there. I think there are a lot of corporate managements who, are, who have not, properly embrace this yet and if I were you I would go to shareholders and say why don't you start asking your corporate managements what they're doing on this agenda because I think you'd find that there's an assumption that they have less freedom than they have and I think that's a way to really start to encourage more companies and really speaks directly to the food question because if you think about capacity building then yes you have to talk about okay does the mother get through pregnancy? Does the baby get born? Does the baby get vaccinated? Does the baby have a decent calorific intake? Does the baby get educated? Does the baby have warmth? Does it have shelter? All of those things are what really drives capacity. And within those seven or eight topics I just listed, you've got about 80% of global corporations have a, have a dog in the fight. And it's not easy for big companies to then sit back and say, hey, you know what? It's a Vodafone thing. It's a Glaxo thing. It's not my thing. And I think we have to start to really, and this is why bringing together this kind of coordinated view of, if you will, the, the true value chain of human development is critical. And then I think go to shareholders and start saying, what are, you know, you own shares in that company, what are they doing about this? They've done it on environment, why can't they do it on this? And I think they can, and our experience is that shareholders are super supportive of this agenda, and I think that's how you could really help to drive more engagement on this front. Absolutely right. Justine. 100%. I, I think the, uh, the nutrition piece is absolutely critical. Uh, what's interesting is if, you, is if you look at some of the projects that we've been supporting and some of the ones that, that we've seen work really successfully, technology is often at the heart of them, whether it's in research and developing uh, strains of seeds that are particularly resilient, or whether it's as simple as making sure that local farmers in rural areas get weather reports so they understand what they need to do to protect their crops and when. There are some really basic step for, steps forward through technology that are going to dramatically improve um, f the food and nutrition agenda in terms of partnership and, and what works. I think, you know, DFID spends a lot of time uh, not just investing in programs, but putting the money alongside them so that we can monitor and evaluate how effective those programs are. Um, we're increasingly looking at what we can do to pull that research and make sure that across the board, we can understand what works. Um, I think the, the key to success for us is that when we do see partnerships that are particularly successful, we need to go and understand why and see whether we can transfer those learnings to totally different areas. Sometimes we can and sometimes we can't. Um, but I think broadly, so much of our work now is delivered through partners, that our ability to work with the private sector, with other public sector, uh, donors and with other multilateral organisations is absolutely key to our success. It is so gratifying to see people standing at the back at five o'clock after a very long day today. That was a fantastic session. Um, I think the key takeaway here is that mobile has a huge potential to be used to address the key challenges that we face uh, globally and also a powerful tool for good and social change. There don't seem to be any easy answers, but there's been some fantastic advice and suggestions on solutions uh, from this panel here by working together to leverage the knowledge and networks across governments, NGOs, business, uh, academics. We are much more likely to be successful in creating sustainable, scalable models which will bring about um, effective change. I thank you all very much indeed. I think the crystal uh, ball gazing 
has been fantastic. 